Welcome to the Legacy Series. I'm Lisa Haysha, and my special guest is Michael Levine. I have known Michael for how long? Decades? Yes. yes. He's one About of my 20 oldest years, 20, friends 20 here years. in LA. Yes, and he's someone who I've always admired. He's somebody who is not only a genius, and we'll get into why he's a genius later, but he's he runs companies, he knows how to curate friends in a unique way, and we'll talk about that later too. He's just so unique. He has represented some of the biggest stars in the industry. He walks his talk, he's got a heart of gold, and he's just fascinating. He's somebody that you really could learn from of how to create a life that works. He's a success coach, a publicist, and many more things, an author, so why don't we just get into this? Hi, Michael. Hi. The, the most flattering thing you said about me in that very lavish and generous introduction was that I walk my talk. And the thing that I would say about you, if I were alone with someone who didn't know you, is that you walk your talk. Mm -hmm. And you've always walked your talk. And you've walked your talk, when I first met you, you walked your talk when the walking seemed unusual and unpopular, so it's interesting. Maybe that's why we gravitate toward each other, uh, not only that we're, we have capacity to, to be not somewhat non-traditional in certain contemporary ways, but also that we are, that it's important that we live consistent with so, with who we are yeah. yeah just being true to ourselves mm -hmm. yes so yes so talk to me about how did you get started where did you grow up and how did you become Michael Levine yes so my story is a story of an underdog and a misfit now I understand that today, you know, we all we all look a certain way, don't we? And uh, when you get lavish introductions like the one you gave me, it's very easy to think, see someone today, and think of them as that, as how they've always been. And in my case, that wasn't true. So I was born in New York City. I was born two and a half miles north of Ground Zero. And I was born into a very um, inideal home. My mom was an alcoholic. My father was a nice man, a gentleman, but he was passive and even a bit weak. And so when you are raised in an alcoholic home, basically it's every man for them every man for themselves. Was your father always around? He was, but uh, around physically more than emotionally. I'll talk more about my relationship with my dad in a moment, but the being raised in an alcoholic home is 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 not good, and so you you are you're you're left to figure things out on your own. And, uh, and so it goes. And um, I left the house when I was 17. And I had no real preparation for much of anything. The house was, the alcoholic house was chaotic. I never went to the same dentist twice because they never paid them. And so you live in a kind of chaotic way that is not good for uh, any number of developmental skills. And um, anyway, I left the house at 17 and uh, I went off to college for six months and then I quit because I had no real preparation for college for anything. Well, what, what was your relationship with your mother during that time? The relationship with an alcoholic is very mercurial because alcoholics are very mercurial. On Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, they can be warm and gracious and charming. 
on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, they can be asleep and absent and inattentive. So you live with a sense that the world is a very mercurial, unpredictable, untrustable place. So now it's uh, 18, I've dropped out of college. I have, I'm 18 years old, I got no money, no job, no education, no parenting. And siblings? I've got a sister that's two, two years younger. Okay. She did go to college, I didn't. But in addition to no money, no job, no education, no parenting, and I am at this point in the story certainly scared and skinny, mm -hmm. I have another challenge. And that is something called dyslexia. And so, you know, I don't know, dyslexia is better known today than it was 40 years ago. In fact, I had dinner with David Geffen about a year and a half ago, and I was talking to David. David has dyslexia, I have dyslexia. I was talking to David about it, and he said, you know, Michael, we used to have another word for dyslexia when we were growing up. I said, really, David, what was that? He said, dumb dumb. And so here I am, 18, no money, no job, no education, no parenting, scared, skinny, and dyslexic. And I've got to figure out what to do. And for reasons that I, I, I was interested all my life as a young person in the entertainment industry, and I was interested in, in politics. And so when you're 18 and you're scared and skinny, right? you come, I think, to conclude what I came to conclude, which is that Washington was Hollywood for ugly folks. And that came out here. And uh, off I went. And my journey is a journey of uh, self-creation, self-invention. Something about those traumas in early life, the underdog misfit traumas, created in me that alchemy, that burning, maniacal rage to overcome or succeed. Now, for some it has exactly the opposite effect. It paralyzes them. I don't know why it is that for me it created that drive, and I don't know why for some it paralyzes them. Mm -hmm. That's my story. It's a How did you get the tools that it takes to succeed growing up in a family like that. Like when I moved to Los Angeles, on the train ride I happened to meet an agent who said, oh, come with me. All of a sudden I'm being represented. As, she's kind of a five line and under and an extra agent. Then within a week I happened to get an extra job, I happened to get my SAG card, got moved up, happened to, so you meet the right people, then I met the right, happened to be dating someone in Madonna's band, got to go to a Madonna's wedding, then I met people, contacts, and somehow, what was your story? How did, when you came here, who did you meet? How did you create? Did you know you wanted to be a publicist? How did that happen? I knew that I wanted to, um, I knew a couple of things. I knew that I found the entertainment industry very, very appealing and alluring. I knew that I wanted to eat. I knew that I didn't want to be homeless. And I also knew that I wanted to somehow become you know, what, what my version of relevant was. And so you then ask the question, how do you get the energy, the drive, the, the gumption? And the answer is somehow. You know, when pain, fear and pain are profound teachers in life, uh, I told you, I revealed to you my mom was an alcoholic. I know a good deal about addiction, not that I have, my addictions work. I didn't, I ended up, di I, I don't drink or take drugs, but you know, I know a lot about addictive behavior and I know you do too. Mm -hmm. And what would, a, what would an alcoholic do to get a drink? Well, anything. And they try the front door, the back door, the side door, the chimney, and let me tell you another little uh, secret. My alcoholic friends don't want a drink tomorrow. They want one today. There's a fierce urgency to now when you're engaged in something that you're deeply, deeply committed to. 
And so I was able somehow, I don't really even know how, to create that fierce urgency of now around my work and my success. But how did you start? How did you become a publicist? I know early on you got clients like Michael Jackson that doesn't just fall in your lap. Not in the beginning it doesn't. Yeah, but so uh, how did you manage that? What were your steps for anyone listening and they're coming to L.A. and they've got alcoholism in their family. They don't know which way to go. They're overwhelmed. They're broke. Well, let me first tell you, uh, my, o my alcoholic and overwhelmed and broke friends some surprising good news which is all of those disadvantages that you mentioned, overwhelmed, broke, disadvantaged, all of those things that so clearly appear to be impediments or disadvantages, ironically, paradoxically, over time, can often turn out to be advantages. Now, isn't that interesting? One might say, really? Could you tell me exactly how being broke in Los Angeles is an advantage? Sure. You're hungry. You're hungry. And when you're hungry and you're determined you do a lot of things that people who are less hungry and less determined can and, uh, and uh, are willing to do. So disadvantages can strangely become advantages. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds paradoxical, but so much of life no, in the end is paradoxical. Yes. That's the crazy part. So if you're sitting here watching this right now, and for any reason you do not feel that you have a good working definition in your mind of paradox, my good and valued friends, in the next 24 hours, look it up. Because you can learn so many things in life that don't require par an understanding of paradox. You can learn how to make a Chinese chicken salad. It doesn't require an understanding of paradox. But if you want to learn anything about the big topics, the ones that Shakespeare wrote about, you remember Shakespeare? He used to be in all the papers. <laughs> well, then you better know paradox because all the big topics are rich and pregnant in paradox. Life and death and God and joy and sorrow and pain and, and, and love. These are all topics that are very saturated with paradox. So the paradox, getting back to the point of disadvantage, disadvantage can be an advantage. And good times cause bad policies. So if you're affluent and attractive, as so many people who come to this town are, you appear at first glance to be terribly advantaged. But in the end, that advantage may turn out to be a disadvantage. That is the same in high school. I would say, and I, and I know I go out on a limb in this way, I would say that if you're a young person watching this, and by young I mean maybe, I don't know, under 25, maybe even under 30, but I'll say 25. If you're a young person, 25 or under, watching this right now, and you're from a advantaged home or a prosperous home, I mean upper middle class, and you happen to also be physically attractive, particularly a woman, particularly a woman, I would argue that paradoxically you may have in those two items two strikes going against you. Anyone listening to this would say, really? Two? Being attractive and from an affluent home is it two strikes? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? I don't expect everyone's going to agree with me, but I'd ask you to think about it. And if you come from a home where there isn't advantage, and maybe you aren't as physically attractive, well, there's some possibility that those things will forge in you something 
something. Okay, so I agree with that. But what were your steps when you moved to LA? What did you do? Yes. Where did you live? Did you get roommates? Did you sleep on someone's couch? Or well, Lisa, first of all, I came out here when I was 22. And you know, this sounds so crazy now. But it's true. And it wasn't as crazy years back. It, it, it sounds so crazy today. But at 22 years old, I was married. I was married. And that you know, so, is so, so terribly outrageous and, and um, wild today, because no, very few people get married at 22 uh, today, or less people. <coughs> but at the time, it was uh, uh, kind of much more normative. So I came out and, uh, listen, anyone watching this again they, they say to me, Michael, I can't get a job. I want to do this. I can't get a job. I say, really? Really? I'll get you a job in an hour. I'll get you a job in an hour. All you got to do is work for free for a month. You're going to work for free for a month. And then you're going to create such an extraordinary experience for the person you're working for that when you're getting ready to say goodbye, they're going to say, don't go. Don't go. So I'll get anybody. So that's what I did. I worked cheap. I worked for free and cheap and long and hard. And I created uh, very early on um, a feeling among people that uh, they'd, they'd rather have me stay around than not. But that's what happens when you work a 70 yes. or 80 hour yes. week. Yes. See, I wasn't on. I, 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 when I say, I think there are people, I know there are people listening to this that say, well, the, the, the young man, the scared skinny guy says he, he worked long and hard. I guess, what, what would that mean? Like a 45, 50 hour week, maybe. No, no, no. See, I learned something also kind of quirky when I started working. I started a company, I didn't know what I was doing very well. PR firm I had no idea what a, what PR was, but I why was, PR? Oh, it offered me an opportunity to work in the entertainment industry. Yeah, and possibly get your own PR yeah, if you needed. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. No, okay. so it was so. But here's something I learned, and uh, I'll tell you: if you have a job, you listen to me and listen real good. I promise you, this will help you if you think about it. You're not going to like it very much, but I'll tell you what it is. So. I started 30 years ago going into my office. Now remember, at that point in the story, there is no email. There is no computer. So I start going into the office at 10.30 in the morning on Saturday. And I would stay from 10.30 on Saturday till 2.30 on Saturday. So those would be four hours from 10.30 to 2.30 on Saturday. Here's a couple of things I learned when I did that. First of all, easy parking. See, nobody else is in. Mm -hmm, easy parking. Mm -hmm. Number two, boy, it's quiet in there. Nobody else is in. They're at brunch. Number three, god darn it, those four hours that I did were really worth eight because I wasn't getting interrupted. Ah. And so the four was worth eight. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I then leave the office on Saturday at 2.30 and I have already started my next week eight hours ahead of Mary or Joe who are gonna come in at nine o'clock in the morning on Monday ready to roll. Now, Mary and Joe come in Monday morning at 9 o'clock. I do as well. And I'm eight hours ahead of them. Can Mary or Joe catch me? No. No. No matter how hard Mary and Joe uh, run or work or hard, they can't catch me because I'm eight hours ahead. Like it's, it's like a race that I start eight blocks ahead of anyone else who's running a mile. You can't catch up. Now, here's another little thing I did. I did that thing, the Saturday deal, 
52 weeks a year. See if I may. Even on holidays. Oh, yes. yes. I remember you telling me. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. See. Now, Saturdays. Would I go in on a Saturday, 10.30 to 2.30? Uh, yes, I would. What if it was Halloween? Go in. How about your birthday? Go in. See, each week you get eight hours ahead of your competition. So in week one, you're eight hours ahead. In week two, 16. Then it goes to 24. You see how it works? 52 weeks a year. So Easter, all the whole deal. Four hours every Saturday, and that's how it worked. And most people weren't willing to do that. So. Yeah, but um, just answer the question directly. Like yeah. you, you moved to LA, married at 22. So how old were you when you got married? 22. You got married at 22. I came here seven months after being married. Okay, so then sh you guys got a place together in we LA. We did. I think it was two hundred and forty-seven dollars a month. I ah, thought that's was, about uh, like what I was paying I for two eighty-nine. I think yeah, it was expensive. <laughs> Me too. It was like, how am I going to come up with this each month? That's right. So then you started to work on a PR firm as you yeah. worked for other people. Yes, this idea uh, no, came I know. No, I started. What I started doing is working for free for people. I'd say, hey, I'll do, hey, I'll do that. Hey, I'll do that. Was what it do in you the entertainment business? Entertainment you're looking? business, okay. yeah. What do you need done? I'll do that. How I'll do you it. meet these people? Now? Well, I'd somehow. Somehow you just, you just get out got, Yeah, and listen, so. if I bring to you, if I opened up an L.A. Weekly in front of you right now and you gave me a nice Sharpie pen, I'll give you five free events you can go to in the next seven days if you want it bad enough. But most people who open up the LA Weekly won't look for the five events, and second, they won't go because they're too busy. Or they too or lazy. Busy? They just want to hang lazy. out. And, yes. They want to put their yeah. damn cat pictures on yeah. Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> now, there you go. That's right. So yeah, so you just always had this energy and uh, drive. I you were going to succeed. Yes, and I was blessed by competition that was often lazy and stupid and since so how long did it take for you to get successful a couple years things st it took where you after, started making money couple, where you could yeah. yeah no I started making money right away mm -hmm. listen people again people come to me and say I can't find a job I said son you want a job why don't you go drag your sorry ass down to uh, Ralph's or Albertson's buy some water uh, for 50 cents a bottle and go to the beach and sell it for a buck. You get a job tonight. Come on, come on. Who sold you on this pro victim program? If you want to be broke in America, the number one rule, if you want, if you want, anyone, want, anyone listening to me now, listen here. You want to be broke in America, I'm going to tell you how to do it. Here's how you do it. Think like a victim and you'll be broke. So, there you go. Think like a victim, you'll be broke. So I agree that the way to get a job is to prove your worth, volunteer. Yeah. Yeah. Then you learn skills and you meet other people. If you're hiding out in your apartment, you're not meeting other people. And that's how you get work is by someone noticing you and noticing what you're special at. Yes, now, here's what else you do. Now, now Lisa just gave you the answer, the whole deal. If you didn't hear, you're a dope and you don't deserve to succeed. She just gave you the answer. I'm gonna fill in a little bonus point. May I? Here's what you do. When you get the volunteer gig and the volunteer gig person says, hey, Sally, Sally, would you come in from 10 to 2? 10 to 2, will you do that? Here's what you do. You say, yes, yes, and you come in at 9 and leave at 3. Come in at 9, leave at 3. Come in an hour early, stay an hour late, and find an excuse twice a week to tell the guy or woman who gave you a job, thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. That's it. Absolutely. There's a, something called Volunteer Network. And I try to volunteer with that site, especially when I just came come to L.A. On. I used to go there and meet the most extraordinary people. Come on. There. Yes. Come on. Let's go. Who sold you on this plan of sitting around and so you now have a successful here's PR another firm, here's huh? another one Lise I walk around I've been to parties with you I've been to par parties at your home I walk up to people I'll meet them most of 
frankly, to be very open with you, pretty forgettable, but a few aren't. And I'll say to the ones that are not, for whatever reason, hey, there's something about you. Uh, interesting energy, interesting way about you. Give me your card. I'd like to stay in touch. Now today, too often with young people I hear, I don't have a card. Son, who sold you on that plan? What do you mean you don't have a card? Vista print is 10 bucks. Get a card, make a card. What are you thinking? That's a pass fail question on an IQ test. How are you supposed to stay in touch with people if you don't have any way of doing it? Yeah. You have to be a little smart, a little clever, mostly hardworking and appreciative. Appreciative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, so you started this PR firm. It became successful. Became one of the three largest entertainment PR firms in the country. And I've represented 58 Academy Award winners, 34 Grammy Award winners, 43 New York Times bestsellers, and three U.S. presidents, both political parties. So that means I'm a hooker. <laughs> then you started writing books. Yes, ma'am. Success books and how to make your life work. Can yes. you tell us a little bit about those? Yeah, I started <coughs> writing books. I, my, one of my first books was a book on PR, which became the best-selling PR book of all time. Guerrilla PR. Guerrilla PR. Yes. And, and listen, uh, the key for its success was that it was very accessible. I created a metaphor that simply said, you, you might say, your, your audience viewer might say, so what is PR? And I said, well, I don't know, but let's try this. Let's talk about it as if it were gift wrapping. And so I come to visit you today, or I come to visit you today, and I give you a gift. I come and I bring a gift. And I give you a gift and I give it to you wrapped in a Tiffany box. Well, in your mind, it has a higher perceived value than if I give it to you in no box or a box of less prestige. The reason that's true is not because you're a psychological jackass, but because we get in our culture, we gift wrap everything. We gift wrap our politicians, our corporate heads, our movie and TV stars. We even gift up, wrap our toilet paper. And so, Public relations is analogous to gift wrapping. What is said about you is more powerful than what you say about yourself. Yes. So who, what authors inspired you? Well, the most powerful, um, most impactful book of my life was a book called The Road Less Traveled. And I will tell you the story of The Road Less Traveled and me. Uh, two parts to it. First. Um, Somewhere around 1983, two, four, I can't remember. I'm on a, I'm hurting terribly and I'm divorced. I was married for eight years. So at age 30, I'd been married eight years already. Now I get divorced and so I'm in horrible pain in therapy. And um, therapy's helping but there's, uh, there's probably a missing spiritual component to my life. And uh, so I'm on an airplane to New York, and I see on the airplane to New York three passengers reading one book. And uh, it's called The Road Less Traveled, so I uh, assume that's some kind of sign that I'm supposed to know about it. It's the, at this point in the story, it's the number one best-selling book in America. So I go home and I get the book. And it begins, as if you have read the book or recall the book, it begins with three words. Three words. The first three words of the book are, life is difficult. And I was so shaken by those three words that life is difficult that I don't think I've ever been the same since. 
And I think the reason I was so shaken by the three words, life is difficult, is that when I was growing up, I would get anxious. And then, because no one ever told me life was difficult, I get anxious about being anxious, which is bloody awful. So after reading The Road Less Traveled, I would no longer get anxious about being anxious because I knew life was difficult. So now, the story gets a little more interesting six months later when I decide that I'd like to uh, talk to the author. Now, the author, M. Scott Peck, is the at this point in the story, the author of the most influential book of its time and the number one. So how the hell am I going to get to him? I don't have his phone number. But I find his address and I write him a letter. And he, and I write him a long, vulnerable letter about the impact of his book on me. And he doesn't respond. He doesn't respond. Well, I didn't think that was particularly congruent with the message of the book. So I took the letter that I wrote. Now remember, this is all postal, mm -hmm. no email. And I copied it and I sent it to him again. But this time I sent it to him with another note on top of it. One in which I let him have it pretty good. I said, "You, Dr. Peck, you have a lot of nerve. Well, I didn't expect my second note. It was pretty, uh, I, I bowled him out pretty good. I didn't expect my second note to be responded to, but it was. He wrote me back. That was, again, a postal letter, and he said, listen, you're totally right. I apologize to you. I've been overwhelmed by so many letters, but that's no excuse. I'm sorry I was wrong. And uh, I'm going to be in Los Angeles in uh, three months giving a speech. Would you like to have lunch? And so I did. And that began a 20-year uh, friendship. And uh, a few years ago, I was the person that announced to the world that M. Scott Peck died when he uh, died at age 69 of mm -hmm. cancer, liver cancer. So... Uh, you never know. Mm -hmm. But you got to put yourself out Absolutely. there. Absolutely. And uh, you got to be real. And there we are. So you started writing books yourself. Yes, I did. And that's a challenge with dyslexia. Let me help you on that. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> it's, uh, so how did you write your, the books? Did you get a lot of help? Do you have an assistant help you with that? No, you know what? Because you're I, so busy doing your PR for well, a bit. I'll tell you, I, I, Lisa, you know, we know each other a little yes. bit a long time. So I'm going to reveal to the audience something you already yes. know, and it's a secret. And this has been my secret. And I've used with, it, and it works. With yes. dyslexia. See, so may I, are you... Are you ready to learn the secret? Here we go. This is the secret. This is a tape recorder purchased at an old-fashioned store called Radio Shack. I think it's 39 bucks. And I talk into this thing, which is pretty good when you have dyslexia. Mm -hmm. See? And so that's been my secret. Now, Lisa has been out with me socially and professionally, and I don't think she has ever seen me ever once without me having it because I feel as naked without that tape recorder as a teenage girl would without her cell phone. Mm -hmm. and there we are. Yes, and you gave another tip of writing three things down. Only three things that you want to accomplish. Why yes. don't you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, you know, what I notice is a pattern, you know, of people. They either have no goals or too many. And the first thing about goals is pretty, I, something occurred to me over time. I've studied success for 30 years, and, you know, one thing became pretty clear. And that is that any damn fool, any damn fool, with a plan will beat a wandering genius a hundred times out of a hundred. So if you're 
watching this and you think you're modestly smart, I promise you in the next 48 hours, if you walk into any number of places, you're going to meet a bunch of damn fools. Uh, but here's the problem. If they've got a plan and you don't, they're going to whip your ass 100 times out of 100. So 100, uh, any damn fool with a plan beats a wandering genius 100 times out of 100. But there are people who have too many dreams, too many, they're, 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 they're all over the place, you know. They, and um, I encourage people to limit their goals and dreams, their big goals and dreams, to no less than uh, three, no more than five. Really focus mm -hmm. on the things that matter because you don't want to be all over the place. Exactly. Yeah, I don't think so. And just getting three to five goals makes such a huge difference because you could focus on them and you know where you're going. Well, if you have ten, you're not even going to get those three done. No, so. and, and then you're going to confuse yes. the unimportant with the important and all that yes. and this and the other thing. Uh, what are th three things that in the next five years would really matter to your life? And if you were going to die in five years, all these things, you know. I, I love so much of your work about getting uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, I think, I think your, your, your remarks are profound. Too many people are sleepwalking. Too many people have numbed out, comforted yeah. out, zombied out, Facebooked out, Twittered out, Instagrammed out, and, um, and there we are. Yes. So, last question. What would you like your legacy to be? Well, the cutting edge of my life today is, as opposed to the past, but the cutting edge of my life today is this success coaching, self-creation journey and conversation. And it's, it rotates around this. Only 32% of Americans go graduate from a four-year college. Now, that sounds incredible to us. What do you mean only 32%? Yeah. I've never met anyone who didn't graduate from a college. Well, then you're living in an upper middle class world and that's fine. But only statistically 32% of all Americans graduate from a four-year college. Mm -hmm. Now, that means that 68% of the people walking around the planet didn't graduate from a four-year college. They have three choices, best I can figure out. One, they can sell dope, likely go to jail. Two, they can get a job with a uniform and a name tag. Or three, they can self-educate. And the key is not to wait for somebody to give it to them, is to go out and get it. Only 3% of Americans have library cards. Mm -hmm. See, 97% of Americans buy, drive by the library. Only 3% drive in. Mm -hmm. Here's something that I thought was incredible. Statistics can really be instructive on what to do and what not to do. If you're an American male earning $50,000 a year or less, right? If you're an American male earning $50,000 a year or less, statistics show that you are, on average, drinking six beers on Sunday during football season. If you're an American male drinking, if you're an American male earning $50,000 a year or less, you're likely drinking six beers on Sunday during football season. Now, if you're an American male, earning $150,000 or more, you're not drinking six beers on Sunday. Your choice. Let me know how it works out. There are behaviors and there are habits that can lead us to prosperity and to a life of uh, uh, a meaning. Uh, you talk about getting out of the damn house. I think you're right. Get out. And do something you would even encourage. Do something that you wouldn't normally do. Do mm -hmm. something in comfort. I agree with yes, you. Yes, yes. Once you uh, get out of your comfort let me cocoon. Tell you, let me tell you what yes. I tell. I, I, I talk to actors a lot, mm -hmm. right? I say, you want to be a better actor? Oh, yes. They think I'm going to say, go to an acting class, right? No, 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 no. 
Here's what you do if you want to be a better actor. Ready? In the next seven days, go to either, spend one hour, go to either a 12-step program, an emergency room, or a strip club. One of those three. In the next seven days, take one hour and go to an emergency room, a 12-step meeting, or a strip club, and you will be a better actor than taking 20 more acting classes. Agree or disagree? I agree. There you Living go. in real life. Real Living life. life. Living life. Real and therapy life. especially, because most people aren't good actors because they can't get out of their head, mm -hmm. and they're too self-conscious, or they're dealing with shame, or guilt, or insecurities, and if they could work out those issues, they're right. better actors. I do believe, I don't know how you feel about this, um, but I do believe that Dr. Phil has contributed something to the American conversation that's significant. When he, about 10 years ago, looked into the TV camera and said in his southern accent, how's that working for you? Mm-hmm. That's huge. See, I think that's valuable because valuable. when people come to me, Mary or Joe or Phil or Sarah or Arthur or whatever the hell they are, and they're telling me their story about their lives and their problems and their dis and how and how they figured it all out and they're going to do it, really, really, how's that working for you? Well, you know, I don't need to carry business cards because I. That's fantastic. How's that working for you, son? Mm -hmm. You got no money in your pocket. You got no money right, in your bank right, account. Right. You're broke, but yet you got a plan for everything. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, it's. Um, so, what do you want your legacy to be? The self education. Self -education. To tell the 68% that didn't win, as mm -hmm. Warren Buffett calls, the ovarian lottery. Mm -hmm. Warren Buffett says you win the ovarian lottery. So, I didn't win it. See, I didn't get good cards. But I want my legacy to be that I can assist people and they most importantly can assist themselves by doing a series of small habits to um, to self motivate self actualize self develop self teach and create a uh, mm -hmm. an idealized life for them which might be different than yes. my idealized yes. life because somebody may say I don't so want to inspire that, that. Yeah, I want to. I want to tell them that they have the capacity to yes. do it, and Brock's not going to do it for them, and Oprah's not going to do it for them, and the girls on Sex and the City aren't going to do it for them, and I'm not going to do it for them, and you're not going to do it for them, and your boyfriend's not going to do it for you. You're either going to do it for yourself or not. That is true. What a great legacy. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming today and sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you. I Thanks appreciate for the opportunity. It. Yes, wonderful interview.